welcome to Erasmus University of Rotterdam. It's a pleasure, a great pleasure, and of course a privilege to host this very important conference on access to health insurance here at Erasmus University of Rotterdam. It is the first conference of its kind, and that is quite extraordinary given the importance of the subject. As far as I know, these valuable experiences have never before brought together in one place, in one time, in one forum, where scientists and practitioners and policy makers can share what they've learned and talk together about what must be done next and what can be done better. And that is what we are doing today. In particular, this international conference has been organized to convene two fields namely financial inclusion and healthcare insurance, because the organizing committee felt that particularly between these two fields, cross-fertilization, synergies can be expected, are necessary. We are bringing together all these experts, all these practitioners, all these leading academics in this field. This would not have been done uh, without the appointment of Professor Stella Kimbo. My name is Stella Kimbo. I'm a professor at the University of the Philippines School of Economics, and I'm also currently the holder of the Prince Glass Chair. It's one way, number one, to prevent poverty in the short run, and also in the long run, because if you are able to protect people today, they actually get healthier, and they become more productive workers, and in the long run, that's reduced poverty. About 100 million people around the world fall into poverty every year due to health reasons and health expenses. So protecting poor people from these devastating financial <coughs> impacts should be a concern for all of us. Catastrophic expenditures force people into poverty. Farmers, men and women, and other small entrepreneurs cannot invest in their farms and firms. And by investing in health insurance, expenses as a result of illness in the family become more manageable and have less effect on their ability to invest in economic activities. Health insurance in itself should be seen as an investment in economic development. I'm Fola Laoye, chairman of Hygieia, um, which is a, an integrated health group in Nigeria, working with the health insurance fund to deliver uh, health insurance to low-income groups in the country. Trying to health system uh, for a country that's very disparate, that has many different cultures, very, you know, geographically disparate, is quite difficult. But particularly made more difficult because of challenges of infrastructure, of human resources, you know, of real capacity. Uh, and that's something that, you know, health, you know, um, needs to really be, be successful and viable. We go to a population, community, which has no understanding or limited understanding of health insurance. Uh, so they tell you, I will participate in it, but if I don't fall ill, I will come for my money. Yeah? So uh, insurance literacy, you know, trying to educate people to understand that this is insurance, and it's insurance for you when you fall ill, that you can use it, when you don't fall ill, it's still important to participate. You know, that is really a challenge. If we want people to understand insurance, if we want people to participate, if we want people to pay, we have to invest so that people understand it. Today, insurance education is only given to the industry adjudicators, agents, claims processors, but the people who have to pay are not educated. is no one-size-fits-all solution, that customization is necessary, that there are different issues, both cultural, financial, circumstantial, that must be brought into the paradigm. However, we know that to do that requires some systemic thinking. We can't reinvent the wheel in each village, not possible. So we need to develop mass customization. It's not enough to say we need to customize. Now we need to go beyond that and develop mass customization. This means developing a prototype for a new health system, different from managed competition, which is failing in developing countries, different from the subsidy-based 
system which is simply unavailable? I think that there, there's no right model for any country. I, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm hearing from the presentations today. But the, the key issue is that whether you're starting off big, whether you're starting off from the top, or whether you're starting off from the bottom, uh, really doesn't matter. I think it really depends on what is the economic base of the country and what is the skills base and what are the systems that we have. So while my own country may be choosing national health uh, uh, insurance scheme, and it basically is top down, but we've seen the examples in Nigeria, we've seen the examples in Ghana, we've seen the examples in the Philippines, uh, for instance, where around small communities, you slowly built up the base. But the important lesson from all of this, whatever small community-based alternative is set up or insurance scheme is set up, in the end, it must all be integrated in some kind of national uh, universal coverage for all of the citizens of, of, of the country. Three major gaps that we have to address in the area of health insurance and access to care in what we are calling weak states. One is the whole area of financing. Where is the money? Who has the money when? And what is it being used for? If you look at the data, then you will show that the most important money giver to the health sector in this weak state is the individual, that very poor person that we keep referring to. It's not the exchequer, it is not the donors. And yet when discussions like this take place, they're never on the table. We talk about them and for them, and their voices are not there. Secondly, there's a gap in service delivery. It's not about having the money. It's not about being insured. People are not proud because they hold an insurance card. It is, do they get the care that they have been promised when they have that insurance card? That gap is important for us to work on and the quality of it. And third is a gap in regulation and policy. Because where is your protection? I come from a continent where we've seen HMOs fall, fail, and go bankrupt with people's money. There is no protection anywhere. Where is the accountability? Who is taking care of this? Somebody has to be willing to invest in developing these systems so that we can actually start doing something that is relevant, meaningful, timely, affordable, and that will not depend on endless flow of funds and endless discussions who will pay in the rich countries for low-income countries because this is a dying paradigm. I'm Gina Holtz and I'm the project manager with the ILO's Microinsurance Innovation Facility I'm based in Geneva. This topic of capacity building is something that we're talking about more and more. And what, what we've seen from the work that we've done in working through others and funding a number, more than 50 different projects across developing countries, is that there's already a lot of knowledge out there. And yes, there is a, still a need to transfer knowledge um, from some places to others, but nonetheless, knowledge is there, yet people keep continuing to make the same mistakes. So capacity building is essential, and it's really putting knowledge into practice. And this is something that we, we work in now, and we see the need to work more in the future um, within capacity building. I think there are real challenges understanding how we finance uh, access to uh, health insurance, let's say. And then secondarily, how do we get the infrastructure, both the financial infrastructure as well as the care infrastructure, to, to provide that into those segments of the economy that are left out? Um, and I think one of the areas that's especially relevant is when we think about where the services exist now, even in poor countries, they exist in urban areas. And so looking at what would it take to actually transform them down into the rural areas is an especially big challenge, but those are the people most affected and most disenfranchised. I think that's always been one of the most amazing things about uh, we in the West or we in the developed nations describing how poor people spend their money. And one of the works that was done a few years ago, which is Portfolios of the Poor, found that in the financial services space, uh, poor people are not just desirous of financial services, but really active consumers, sometimes working informally in up to 14 different products. And I think insurance is one of those. And I think we're amazed if we even look at the penetration of cell phone coverage. Who would have thought 
15, 20 years ago that some of the poorest people in the world would be really active users of mobile phones. And I think poor people use what's useful for them. And part of our job as donors and as policy experts is to figure out how to make these things relevant as well as how they get financed. There's a lot of things that actually uh, uh, push people to uh, buy uh, health insurance that are not decisively on the price issue. So there's, there's non-financial incentives why people want to buy uh, health insurance. And I think we need to study that a lot more. I think one of the, one of, that's one of the biggest uh, knowledge gaps. us we have to think a little bit more what is it we want the regulator to do or not to do because it's one thing that we cannot do is actually start talking to regulators and tell them you have to regulate because regulate before is actually something is there is very dangerous the policymakers should stimulate good governance and that means ensuring first of all that they use their resources efficiently and they also have processes you know which will stimulate participation of private sector in the insurance industry. Regulation is the most challenging and uh, they should have more dialogue. Pri the government with the, the private sector, we are in the same boat and they should, uh, even the private sector should listen the, the challenge of the government and, and the other side too. There are other collaborations, you know, outside health that could make a difference. Take water. 60% of communicable diseases are waterborne. Give people good drinking water, that thing will crash. When you talk about the environment, the drainages are blocked. Stagnant water, that's a breeding place for mosquitoes. That's a vector for malaria. 50% of our disease burden is malaria. Clear that. Let the water move. Let us destroy all the breeding places. Malaria will crash. You understand? So these are some of the things that we have to see collaboration Minister of Health, Minister of Environment, Ministry of Finance, you know, like that, Minister of Water, Resources and Sanitation, so that we reduce the burden of disease through preventive methods and other infrastructural solutions. Health insurance is somewhat different than other financial products. For example, it does involve a big element of public good. It is also linked to broader complex issues that require national leadership and diverse partnerships. To make sure that all the efforts have positive long-term outcomes, it is all the more urgent that, that we together share what we know about what works and what does not work. What is certainly important is to ensure that healthcare reaches the poorest and the most marginalized families. And it should go without saying the providers have a lead role in product design. <laughs> Donors and academics can also help, for example, with research to understand client needs better. If, through insurance, we can help people become healthier and more productive and prevent impoverishment when they get sick, then we really need to focus on what is stopping us from doing so. I hope that we can take it forward also in the future. I thank you so much. Thank you.